Well, as Susan and I uh, were driving over, um, for those of you who don't know, Susan's my wife, we were driving over for the dinner on Friday night. We were coming over the uh, 45 here on the bridge, and, and we looked out, and the sun was setting, all right, and the clouds, and it was just, it was just spectacular. Uh, to see the reflection of light and to see the sun getting lower and lower and lower. And, and, and it was just awesome, you know. And, and as a matter of fact, it stirred my heart. I go, wow, look at that. Isn't, that. isn't that gorgeous? You just can't help but to respond in a moment like that. Well, as I was preparing for today and as I was exploring and thinking through, okay, God, how do you want us to explore Leviticus today. You know, my heart was captured with a sense of awe and wonder. You know, how was I going to encapsulate everything that there is to say uh, today uh, from this book in God's Word? Because truly there is. I mean, as I was studying and I was getting ready, even yesterday, even this morning, my heart was tugging, and I'm like, man, I could lecture on this for hours. Don't worry, I'm not going to lecture. But boy, if I got going, I could go. It, it just, there's so much here to explore. But you know, the fact of the matter is, maybe you're wondering, you know, you have wonder, and you wonder why the book of Leviticus is even in there. And, and some of you have shown me more devotional books that, you know, supposedly get you into God's Word and They'll go Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They just skip over Leviticus. And, and it's, it's become apparent that with all the rules and the regimens and everything that's there, if we get down into the to weeds of it, it's easy to dismiss it and say, well, that, there just isn't anything there for us. But you know, in a world of fractured and divided loyalties and divergent agendas, even through this book, God reveals his heart for his people. He's calling them into relationship with himself such that even in this book, yes, filled with all these ways to, to worship God through the rituals and practices and sacrifice and all that kind of stuff, we still find verses like Leviticus 26, verse 12, where God says to his people by way of promise, and I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves, and I have broken the bars of of your yoke and made you walk erect. God's desire for his people as they walk upright in integrity and in freedom. And yes, it is even found in the book of Leviticus. It's there to be discovered. And over the past few weeks, we have followed a map from a ministry uh, called the Bible Project. And, and it's proven to be very, very helpful in understanding the layout uh, we started a few weeks ago on the bookends and worked our way towards the middle. So a number of weeks ago, we started with the ritual sacrifices and the ritual calendar days as a way of God describing to these people that he just called out of Egypt how to be a people, how to be his people, how to be his sons and daughters in this world. And so in those rituals, he gives them a, a, a schedule, a, a rhythm of life that they can follow. And then through uh, setting apart one part of that family, uh, Aaron and his family called the Levites, ultimately that's what they're called. They're set aside to do the ceremonies, to do all that uh, ritual, to help the people of Israel uh, worship God. And, and so in those Next few chapters on either end, they're describing who these people are and how they're to uh, be set aside and how they're to live. And then uh, we looked at the, at the rituals of purity. In other words, the purity laws in terms of the ritual purity. In other words, how do you, come, how do you prepare yourself to go into worship, in effect? 
How do you discern what is clean and unclean so that you can go freely into God's presence? And then the moral purity, which, yes, there's a concern about the externals, but that moral purity is also addressing matters of the heart and taking a look at what's going on inside that works its way out to the surface of our lives. And so there's challenges in those chapters. Well, today, we're coming right into the middle, right at that defining day called the Day of Atonement. And the entire book rotates around this. It goes around this book, or around this chapter, in which is described this one day set apart in the course of the year, in which God's people are being called to deal with matters of sin. You know, maybe you've referred, heard it referred to as Yom Kippur. That's how it would be said in Hebrew, Yom Kippur, the day of covering. That's what Kippur means, a day of covering in which the sins are dealt with. And the day was full of, yes, sacrifice and ritual and blood and all of these things as you read through it. And, it's, and it can be overwhelming, but if you just think of it in this way, that all of it underscores that God is life and sin is death. God is life and sin is death. And he goes on to explain even about the blood and what's, what's going on with the blood. If we look at Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it underscores this idea of life and, and striving for life when we read, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. It is the life of the one sacrifice that provides that covering for the person who's bringing the sacrifice. So that day of atonement, that central day, was a day of cleansing and a day of removing. And, and here's how it usually unfolded, okay? This is how it unfolded. Whether it was in the tabernacle, that was before the people of Israel really settled down in the in the land of Israel that God had given to them, or in the temple worship when they were able to establish their presence in the land and build a temple. The fact that uh, in, the, in the morning, animals were brought forward, one a bull, two goats. There might have been other sacrifices involved depending upon the time of day or year and, and what the calendar said. But the idea behind the bull and the goats were that they were to be offered up on behalf of the people of Israel and to atone, that is, to cover over their sin. Uh, what would happen is Aaron and his family would put their hands on the bull, and that bull was sacrificed, and that blood was shed on behalf of Aaron and the priesthood, the Levites, so that their sins would be atoned for. And then there were the two goats, and there was a, they were equal in size and, and looked roughly the same. And, and through lots, one was designated to be sacrificed, and the other one was going to be called the scapegoat. But then that one that was designated to be sacrificed would have been brought out before the people, and Aaron would have put his hands, or the high priest, whoever it was that was serving as high priest that day, would have put his hands on the goat, and that goat would have been sacrificed. And then the blood would be collected and be brought into the tabernacle. And the blood would be sprinkled in some key strategic pot spots. And, and all of it symbolic of a cleansing, of a covering over of the sins of the people and of the priests. But then as part of that, as part of that day, then there was this one final goat. And this one goat was brought out before the people and and everybody would be looking at the goat, and the goat would be just standing there looking at everybody else. And, and the priest would put his hand on the goat, and he would pray over that goat and say, Lord, unto this goat, putting all the sins of your people, all the sins of the priests, all the sins of all of those who are in your family for the things that we have done, for the things that we didn't do that we knew we were supposed to do, for those things that we did that we didn't know we weren't supposed to do, for those, all those sins, God, we place on this goat 
And then that goat was led out into the city, from the city, out into the wilderness, and then released into the wilderness. And that's where we get the term scapegoat. For it went out into the wilderness, bearing the weight of the sins of the people of Israel. So it was a day of cleansing, that every sacrifice, the impurity of sin, was dealt with. It was a removing of the sin of the people, for it was all placed on a goat and, and then released into the wilderness. And, and for those who, who witnessed the events of this day, every part of it, because there were certain garb that the priests were supposed to wear, there were certain ways they were supposed to do things, every single part of it reminded them of God and His holiness, their unholiness, and the fact that despite the distance, despite the gap, the holy God took the initiative to pursue relationship with His people and tell them, this is how you have relationship with me. He reached out to them. And so every single part of the day was dedicated to that, such that what well, we see in Leviticus chapter 16, uh, verse 30, when we read this, for on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you, and you shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. You're clean is the bottom line to this day. Before the holy God, you're clean. It, it opened up a freedom of relationship, a freedom of, of access so that they could be one with God. And he could be with them. Now, we all know those times when relationships get a little murky, right? When things happen and maybe a cloud comes in and, and kind of casts a shadow over relationships. Uh, it could be something inadvertent. You know, somebody says something or does something and, and you, you, know, you say, hey, no harm, no foul, don't worry about it, it's okay, right? You, we've all had that experience. But then there are those times when something really goes south and, and a relationship is strained and it just feels like a weight. It's just weighing you down, you know? And, and the day just seems gloomier and darker and, you know, your thoughts just can't be jolted out of the cycle of blame and whatever's going on in your heart and head. I mean, as a father of four daughters, you got to know that there were days, right? There were days. Now, there were those mornings when, for whatever reason, maybe we were down to one car, had to get these four girls to four different places, all by 8.10, all right? And trying to get everybody out the house, the dogs aren't cooperating, they're taking their sweet time in the backyard, uh, somebody forgot their lunch, somebody forgot their bag, somebody's not quite dressed. It's like, hurry up. Come on, come on, move, move, move. And sometimes, for whatever reason, in those moments, I kind of bark a little German. You know, mach schnell, mach schnell, gross, gross. I don't know why, I just do it. And I'm trying to get them out the door. And trying to get them in the car. I hope you're laughing with me and not at me. Because then we're driving down the road, and all of a sudden, because we live in the northeast part of Oshkosh, we have those railroad tracks. And then the arm comes down, and you can tell how long that train's going to be by the number of engines. And boy, I'd love to say, at those moments, I just sat back and said, girls, let's talk about the providence of God and how we can find comfort even in times like this. No, it's like, you know what? We would have beat this train if you were in the car on time, if you'd been dressed, if you'd had your bag, if you hadn't forgot your lunch, if you dun, 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 dun. My whole day 
Because even as I'm speaking those words, even as they're coming out of my mouth, you know, the clouds are forming. You know, my, my spirit's upset. And all day long, it's like, oh, I wait, I burn. The clouds are thick and dark. Just feel a little lethargic inside, you know, just kind of, ugh. And so I remember times going to do the pickup, and picking up all these girls and looking at the one with brown eyes and looking at the one with green eyes and looking at the one with the blue eyes and can't remember <laughs> all, the, all the colors. But, um, and saying, you know what? What you're what your dad did this morning, you know, when I lost it. I, I'm, I'm sorry. It was inappropriate. It was out of bounds. I'm, I'm, I am sorry. Will you forgive me? And to have those eyes looking back at me and saying, oh, Daddy, we love you. You are forgiven. And in that moment, can breathe a little easier. The weight is off the shoulders. The clouds part. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. And life is good again, right? Well, just picture that day in which all these sacrifices are going, all these sounds. It was a day you know, that there was a heaviness to it because on that day of atonement, the people of Israel had to look at themselves in the mirror and say, God, you're holy. We are clearly not. And as the priest is going through the rituals of the bull and then the one goat and then releasing the other goat and all the, the, the sounds and the sights and the smells and and everything that's going on, to have the priest go into the temple and then come out at the, towards the end of the day to hear the high priest look out and with arms raised say, you will be cleansed. How liberating that moment is. And that for those people to, then to hear that blessing that the high priest would give when he would say, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. There must have been such a, an awe factor, a, a relief. You know, maybe it was at that moment that a, the psalmist reflecting on, on all that had taken place and hearing those words spoken wrote in Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions, our sins from us. And at that moment, everybody gathered together would have felt, a, yes, a oneness with one another, but a oneness with their God. And as a matter of fact, the word atonement, the word atone, is actually an old English word that means at one. You see it right there in the word atone. But it, it used to mean that a relationship was now at peace and indeed for the people of Israel in this moment, they were experiencing that sense of peace. But what happened? The sacrifices had to keep going, right? And they could be guaranteed that a year from that day, they would be gathering together in the morning and another bull and two goats and others would be prepared uh, for the sacrifices that needed to take place on that day. Uh, yes, they experienced a covering, that, that atonement, that oneness, but for a while. 
And, and you even have to think that even though they knew that things had to be repeated, somebody had to wonder, I wonder whatever happened to that goat that went into the wilderness? Whatever became of that goat? Oh, there goes another one. And next year we'll send another one out. And so with that, with that repetition over and over and over again, well, they knew for the moment that they were covered but they were waiting for something more. Now, in many ways, I think you could probably finish the sermon from here. I mean, you know where I'm going with this. And, and even if someone goes to church but twice a year, on Christmas and Easter, they, they know what direction this is going in. Uh, but yet, the fact of the matter is, the story is no less beautiful, told over and over and over again, to remind our hearts, to be in awe and wonder at what God has done and accomplished for us. As we, as we consider what God has done, it should be no less beautiful than, say, the, the sunrise this morning, where if you were outside, say, just before 6, you know, there's the glow towards the east, and if you look to the southwest, you can see Jupiter up there, bright. If you look a bit to the southeast, uh, you'll see Saturn way just, you know, it's there. The stars are fading, but those planets are, and you're just like, wow, that's awesome. Or, or at night when the sun is setting and all those brilliant colors. You know, if your heart is not moved, if your heart is not touched, if your heart is not impacted by a scene like that, if you don't have an awe, then you need to check your pulse to see if your heart's even beating. So that when we come to this point of thinking about God and the wonder of his work and his grace that he's poured out, our hearts should be moved to awe because as you trace the promises of God and his actions, all the way from the, the Garden of Eden where this couple expecting paradise all of a sudden found themselves with paradise there it's, it's broken due to their rebellion it's 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 gone in the moment but even in the pronouncement of curse upon the serpent they see hear that glimmer of the gospel where in that moment it said to the serpent you will bruise his head there's coming somebody there's coming somebody You'll bruise, you'll, you'll get him in the ankle, you, but he's going to smash your head. He's going to smash your head. He's going to destroy you. From that little glimmer of the gospel, we trace it through and we see God making a pronouncement to a man named Abram, which means father. And, he, and here's this old man with no children yet. And God says to him, Behold, your name is no longer Abram. It's going to be Abraham, which means the father of many. And through you, through your, through your descendants, everyone's going to be blessed. And so children come along, and the people of Israel are taken down, and, and they are in Egypt, and then they become slaves, but God delivers them, and they come out of Egypt. And at this point, this is where we're getting those books of the Torah, those first five books in the book of Leviticus where God is revealing his heart for his people and what it means to be in his family. And then we see the people of Israel moving along and at times they have high points, at times they have low points, but the promises keep coming and God keeps reiterating those promises such that we can read in Jeremiah chapter 31, just listen what God spoke to the people of Israel. Even in the midst of a time of rebellion, even in the midst of a time when their hearts were far from him, he cried out to them and he said, listen, 
I care for you. I love you. I'm reaching out to you. And he says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Wow! What a promise that is. Looking forward to what God is going to do. Looking forward to that day when we read this. In Matthew, where Jesus is sharing his heart and the values and the priorities of the kingdom and with his disciples, and he says, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. All that was building up was pointing to moments like this, For there were any number of moments, any number of incidents where Jesus spoke about why he came. And even this word ransom here connects back to the Day of Atonement. Even this word ransom speaks of of a cleansing, of a removal, of a freedom, of a liberation of an openness now between God and his people. And this is what Jesus is declaring to them, that in me, the the covering that was foreshadowed in the Day of Atonement, all those sacrifices are now done because they're going to be complete and whole in me. Leviticus looked forward. And the writer of Hebrews looked back, and as the writer of Hebrews looked back, and he was reflecting on what Jesus did, he says in in, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, these words, starting in verse 26, for then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world, but as it is, he, that is Jesus, has appeared once, for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it was appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him." Oh, as the writer of Hebrews wrote, look back, he said, Leviticus now makes complete sense because Leviticus and all about it was pointing to Jesus. And what we see in Jesus is the fulfillment and the completion of it all. That in Jesus being nailed to the cross, in Jesus being put in the tomb, in Jesus rising on that third day, the sacrifice was full, the sacrifice was complete, the sacrifice never needed to be repeated ever, ever, ever again because Jesus paid it all. As the hymn said, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He has made me white as snow. We can look back say, wow, this is incredible. The the liberation, the the freedom that gives in relationship with God that the price has been paid. That our hope is secure. 
Why, you just, you read in Hebrews 10, and, and I'd encourage you, read through Hebrews 9 and 10, and, and all the way through that, it all points back to the Day of Atonement, it all points back to Leviticus. In some respects, you can't make sense of the book of Hebrews apart from the Leviticus. One looks ahead, one looks back, but they bring into clear focus the person of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished. In Hebrews 10, we read this. I'm just going to read it for you. Just let it simmer in your heart and soul. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith that our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. If you are here today and you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the Day of Atonement was about looking ahead to what Jesus is doing. And what Hebrews was telling us is that because of what Jesus Christ accomplished and the full and complete sacrifice that he made, that we are a new people with a new hope, with a new future, and we're called to live that way. And we're called to be liberated in that. That why would we then allow things like anger or lust, jealousy or greed, gossip or any number of things that we could list, why would we allow those even to have a place in our lives? Because of what Christ has done for us. He has freed us and moved us from death to life, from darkness to light. Therefore, let's walk in that way. And maybe you're here today, and this is the first time you've heard anything like this. And you're wondering, wow, who is this Jesus? Well, after the service, come and talk to me. I'd be glad to share with you more. Talk to Pastor Joe, talk to one of the other staff members, or one of our overseers, or talk to that friend that you came with. And they'd love to share with you more about who Jesus is and what he has done on your behalf. But if you're here today, as our worship team comes to lead us in, in, a, in a final song, if you're here today and, and you're following Jesus, I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray for all of us that we would live out that relationship and following Jesus together, we would be that people who are liberated, that are walking upright, that are ready to declare to a world that's lost in darkness the marvelous light of God's work in, in us and what he's done on our behalf and, and, and sharing that with people that we know, sharing that with people we care about, sharing that with people that we interact with. Well, that we would be a people that are that community of faith, bringing faith to the community in such a way that when people ask us a reason for the hope that is within us, we can say because of what Jesus Christ accomplished for us.